We got a huge show for you guys this week. Mickey Loomis joins the podcast. We do nothing but big guests on this show. So we got another one for you guys right there. Talk about the CJ Gardner Johnson trade, his cap philosophy, and just really his outlook on the quarterback class now and moving forward. A lot of topics there. On the show, me and Mike are going to discuss the change of quarterback to Andy Dalton, the impact of not having Mike Thomas at wide receiver, what they can do in the secondary to beat this explosive Vikings uh, offense, and much, much more. And as always, we are presented by Dot Rap Company, coming to you from a remote Better Call Botto podcast studio. And if you are looking for a way to make your car look really cool, you want to advertise your business with the most co- cost-effective form of advertising that wrap company specializes in graphic design custom and commercial vehicle wraps wall murals and storefront signage whether you're wanting to give your car a fresh new look or you want to transform the face of your business dwc can help get you notice call today 985-237-4781 if you are wondering what they do or if you've been on the fence about getting your car wrapped check out their instagram page that wrap company everything they do looks cool it looks incredible you can make your car cooler you can make your business pop if you need legal help with any of the following, car wrecks, offshore injuries, 18-wheeler collisions, Maritime and Jones Act, hurricane and storm claims, you better call Bado 504-323-4777 or 985-677-1085 for your free consultation and case review, BadoLaw.com. And as always, check out our guys, Firehouse Subs, Veteran Boulevard's location. Great food, great people do a lot to help the community, so make sure you check them out. Another episode of the New Orleans Dot Football Podcast. Let's go. Put your hands in the air, cause it's on right now. Yeah, we back up in this thing, and we coming for the crown. We tripping Kev on the mic. It's about to go down. We in the dome right now, we in the zone right now. Put your hands in the air, cause it's on right now. Yeah, we back up in this thing, and we coming for the crown. We tripping Kev on the mic. It's about to go down. As you can tell, last year it was an off year. But we reloaded, and now it is our boss year. A Debo back there, and yeah, we got the badger. Don't forget my shun, and don't forget the pass rush. James QB1 dropping down to MT. Oh, handed off to Alvin with the quick feet. So, when you see the Saints marching, yeah, we gon' trouble you. At the Super Bowl party, eating on them double. We in the dome right now, we in the zone right now. Put your hands in the air, cause it's on right now. Yeah, we back up in this thing, and we coming for the crown. We tripping Kev on the mic. It's about to go down. We in the dome right now, we in the zone right now. Put your hands in the air. Here with Mike Triplett, the big news right now in Saints land, it looks like almost certainly Jameis Winston will not be starting this week. Possible he's active if there is some type of emergency situation and there's a possibility he could play a snap if disaster strikes, but it seems... 99 point yeah (laughs) infinitely sure that Andy Dalton is starting on Sunday um obviously this changes a lot of stuff with this team I think these two guys I wouldn't say couldn't be more different but they are significantly different types of quarterbacks I think the offense the way it operates changes I think the way the targets get distributed changes I think pretty much everything changes so as you look at it this week heading into this game What's the number one thing on that list that you think is going to be way different than it was last week with James Wilson at QB? All right, I got two takes here. I got an optimistic and a pessimistic. My pessimistic take is that everyone thinks Jameis has been the problem because the offense stinks and replacing him with Andy Dalton will solve everything. That's a big stretch because, first of all, as I know we mentioned on the last podcast, Jameis Winston won the starting job for a reason. I mean, it wasn't even a battle for a reason because they think Jameis Winston has real high upside and can do special things. And Andy Dalton's now on his fourth team in four years. He's a very good quarterback with a very good track record in Cincinnati. But, you know, it's not like he's going to come out here and be 2018 Drew Brees, much less, you know, 2011 Drew Brees. So expectations shouldn't be super high. But my pessimistic – I mean, my optimistic take is the one thing we think this offense can do better is – just get the ball 
in the hands of Alvin Kamara. Get the ball in the hands of Jarvis Landry. Mike Thomas is not going to play, unfortunately, which is a big loss for this offense. If he was here, we'd say just get the ball in the hands of Mike Thomas. And then obviously um, Chris Olave as well. But we think Andy Dalton might be able to do that better. We think that's been sort of a hurdle that Jameis Winston hasn't overcome yet because he's kind of standing back in the pocket, hoping some big plays will develop. Maybe we will see this offense kind of go back to its roots of 12 play drives, short passes, run game, and just try to get some efficient drives together and try to win a low scoring game. Yeah, I, I think I agree with all that. I think that he's definitely more of a rhythm. You know, I, I think the, the yards per target won't be nearly as high. Jameis Winston was, I believe, in the top two or three of that this, this year in the NFL. So I just think the way that they skin the cat's going to be a, a lot different. And you, you kind of hit on some of that stuff. And, and I think the easy money is what they haven't been doing. Their, their uh, yards after catch has been really low. Um, there's just a lot of stuff that, that I think hasn't been optimized with this offense. And part of that is that Jameis is playing through an injury and he's not quite himself. And there's just a lot of different things that they could be doing. I think Andy Dalton might also do a slightly better job of helping the offensive line be organized or changing a play when they need to change a play. I think just that experience. And, you know, I wrote a story this week just about how he's kind of been a weapon for them behind the scenes and game planning, recognizing stuff, seeing what other teams are doing. I think on some of this stuff where there's a cover zero blitz and it's not getting picked up, I think Andy Dalton yeah. helps them with that stuff. So that's going to be something that they really, I think, improve at this week. And look, the other thing that I like that he said this week too, my worry about him playing is, is okay, they don't have chemistry. And that was one of the issues with Jameis. He didn't have the time on task. And I think that they were still working up to that chemistry. Dalton said, hey, look, this guy was rehabbing an injury all spring. I've gotten a lot of reps with him. I've got the reps this week. I feel good about where I'm at. We'll see how that pays off. But that, that's my biggest concern is that he's not used to him. But I think he's been around enough, has had enough reps, has changed systems enough that he probably knows how to succeed within that. But he does have to go out there and prove it. He was, you know, as we say all this stuff, he didn't win the quarterback job. He was the backup. He was signed to be the backup. He got paid less money. There's a reason Jameis was ahead of him. But there is definitely a possibility that his best traits fit Jarvis Landry a little bit better. They fit Alvin Kamara a little bit better. Probably don't fit Chris Olave better, but when Mike Thomas is out there, if Andy's still the starter, might fit him a little bit better too. So it will be interesting to see what philo like philosophically how they move the ball, how it changes. Well, I think it's probably the – smallest drop-off from starter to backup in the NFL. Because I think the Saints genuinely believe they have the best backup quarterback in the NFL. So I, I don't think you're, you know, too worried. It should be a seamless transition. Uh, Over Teddy? I think the Saints believe that. I really do. I You know, but at, let's let's – put that same ballpark you know same comparison they felt really good when they had Teddy and what did he do coming in was he like four and one I think when he started uh five games for for Drew Brees so I think they that's been a new philosophy of this team too we want a seamless transition to the backup um but I also think Andy Dalton's going to get more credit than he deserves because I'm willing to bet that a running back doesn't lose a fumble in this game for the first time all season. I'm willing to bet that the rest of the offense doesn't sabotage itself with four penalties in the first half like they did at Carolina. And that's not going to be because of Andy Dalton. That's going to be because that stuff was just, you know, it, it was an unlucky glut of just shooting themselves in the foot. Um, like you said, Andy Dalton could be the reason that the pass protection is better. I don't think he'll take as many sacks as Jameis Winston was taking in the first couple couple of weeks. But a lot of that stuff, just the law of averages and just cleaning it up and just realizing we're one and two now and we can't get away with that sloppiness anymore. And, and then they'll play a clean game and everyone will be, oh, it's because of the quarterback switch. Yeah. There's eight more things that have to go right in addition to the quarterback switch. Yeah, it's too simplistic, and, and we've talked about that a lot. Like, it's unfair to put everything on Jameis. And, look, I'll say this, too. Like, I don't think that they feel like they've seen enough of him. I think that they, they don't believe three games is enough of a, a evaluation. Having said that, somebody gets in there, they start winning games. Things can change. Last year we saw Trevor Simeon lead him to a comeback, and you had to keep playing him. And, sure, there were other injuries and stuff, but you had to give him a chance because he showed you something. Dalton could definitely show him something and start winning games, but – I don't think that they're going into it this this week thinking we're done with Jameis. They're no, they're not no, no. playing Jameis because he's hurt. They don't. They think he can do better I than he's played. I don't think they're just using that as an excuse. Dennis Allen said this was a health decision. We yeah we haven't seen enough of Jameis to bench him, and I think it worked out perfectly because being able to use the health now you're not risk. I mean 
making a quarterback switch is such a big move. You risk alienating people who disagree with your decision. Uh, you miss messing with the quarterback's confidence if they're like, oh, th you know, three games that weren't really completely only my fault, and now you're giving up on me. None of that is happening right now. Um, now, if Andy Dalton catches fire and they win three in a row and this offense is humming with them, then maybe they have a tough decision to make where they, you know, Tom Brady and Drew Bledsoe or something like that. Be a good problem to have. But they can always say all along, if the offense isn't getting better with Andy Dalton, well, Jameis just needed to take a week or two or three to get healthy, and now we're going back to Jameis. And it won't be, well, yeah, are you going to bench me again like you did last time? That's not what, that's not what they're doing here. And so th this worked out well that they can try something new with the offense without totally giving up on Jameis Winston. Yeah, and Drew Bledsoe was the NFL's first $100 million quarterback. Tom Brady was <laughs> pick 199 or whatever it was in – Jameis Winston's a $14 million quarterback over two years. So if Andy Dalton supersedes him, he supersedes him, and that, that's just kind of the, the reality you're in. And this is also a team that's willing to have its first-round pick from a year ago be inactive in favor of a low-paid free agent. So it's not like they're backed into a corner. This isn't uh, an operation where they need to prove the ownership that their money's playing on the field and they're afraid of you know, having, having a, a firing because their investment didn't work out or something like that. This isn't a team that makes those kind of decisions the best players play. They don't care where they come from. Everybody's confident in their jobs, and that's not going to be dictated. But at the same time, I do honestly believe today as we sit here, the idea is, is that Andy Dalton's a backup quarterback. Jameis is still the starter. I think they believe there's more upside with Jameis. And um, there's a reason, again, like I said, why he won the job. So it's going to be fascinating to see what happens this week. I want to see what the offense can do because I think we both agree that Dalton's maybe a little bit more in that breeze mold. And we've said all along – well, us talking before you you worked here, that we kind of felt like this was a Breeze built offense, that this would have been the best array of weapons for him ever. So we'll kind of see how that comes out. We're going to play our interview now uh, with general manager Mickey Loomis. This is brought to you by Desi Vegas Steakhouse, St. Charles Avenue, best steaks in the city. Make sure you check them out. All right, we're joined now by our special guest, Mickey Loomis, general manager of the Saints. Mickey, thanks for coming on. I'm glad to come on. Um, I feel a little bit... Um, I don't know if disappointed is the right word, but the last time I saw you guys, this was a Zoom video podcast, and now I just get audio. I guess I'm not good looking enough. Well, to we be know on you like to video. work behind the scenes. We actually had this talk. You're like, Mickey's going to say he doesn't want to be on camera. He never wants to be on camera. You like you living go. behind the scenes, right? I do. You guys know that. I do. <laughs> exactly. yeah, so we, we anticipated your news. We're just trying to yeah. be good hosts here. Yeah, well, you're doing a good job, as usual. <laughs> Why? It's, I mean, when I hear the explanation and when I see your track record of spending a week in London, a week in Seattle, uh, unplanned week and month in Dallas, yeah. <clears throat> I know you can't speak for the other teams, but, but are you surprised that more teams don't do this? It seems like the way to go. Yeah, I, do. I am a little surprised, but look, each team has to make their own decision. And look, part of this is we've been here twice. You know, we've stayed the full week. We've won. Um, We've had these games, you know, earlier in the season, uh, each of these years, and so it's kind of an opportunity to not only um, go and acclimate to the um, the time change, but it also gives us an opportunity to do a little team building and be together 24/7, and and for um, you know teammates and and people in the organization to get to know each other a little better. So that's the uh, that's the extra benefit. And no brainer. I mean, when you get tabbed for the London game, you, you I mean, yeah, you know but, that's what you want to do, right? Yeah, we know that's what we want to do. And look, I, we've had guys on our staff that have done it the other way. And, um, you know, interestingly, I think some of them over the years have kind of going in felt like, well, it was better to go late. But every one of them has said to me after the fact, ah, it's way better to go early. So yeah. we'll see. Um, and what about the bye week? Uh, was that a choice? Yeah, that's a choice. Yeah. yeah, that's a choice. You know, we, the, the league does a good job of giving us some options. You know, do you want to play at home before you leave? Do you want to play away? Where are the, you know, if you're going to play away and you're going to embark after the game, where would you like to go from? And so we give them a few options and they, and they uh, make that work. And then, um, <clears throat> you know, the bye week is – that's it. This is the first time we haven't done the bye week after the game, so it'll be a little bit different for us. But I just felt like Dennis and I both felt like ah, it's too early for the bye for us. 
you know, we'd rather have one later. Now, we didn't expect one <laughs> that much later, but um, that's fine. Not going to ask you who's starting a quarterback this week unless you want to just say that on <laughs> I'm your not. Own. Okay, all right. But the moves you guys <laughs> made this offseason, signing both Jameis and Dalton and trading yeah. away your first-round pick, do you see a possible market inefficiency coming up next offseason in that market with just all the quarterbacks that are expected to be available? Um, I haven't really thought about that. I'm just focused on, and we're focused on, um, you know, making Jameis and, and uh, in our group here as successful as they can be and give them every opportunity and put them in a position to win, and then we go from there. So I haven't thought about next off season at all. <laughs> when do you guys kind of start <clears throat> thinking about? Is that is that always after the season? Yeah, I, you know, I think, look, I think one of the things – there's, we've always got an eye on next year and the year after. We always have an eye on that. So I'm not going to say that we don't. But I think that um, in order to do you know, your current players and your current coaching staff justice, you really have to be focused on right now. Um, you know, And right now being this game and then the next game and then the next game. And so that's been the philosophy here. And, and um, I think that's worked pretty well for us. And still just... Continuing to look down the road a little bit, Sean is kind of like a free agent coach. You guys control that situation. Is that something that, that you're looking at now and potentially thinking how you're going to approach that? How, how does that kind of play out, you know, year by year? As it, yeah, as no, look, I, I, I haven't. Obviously, yes, we do have some rights. Um, and there'll be, you know, uh, compensation if, if he chooses to um, – coach for another team next year and, and they want to do that but I we don't I don't spend any time thinking about that that's um look I'm just I'm just excited when I talk to Sean he's excited about you know the stuff that he's doing and having the, the time off and getting recharged and and uh, I'm not surprised that he's already said hey he sees himself coaching again I'm not surprised at that at all um he's a fantastic coach and and um, any organization be really lucky to have him when you guys made the decision to trade C.J. Gardner-Johnson, I don't know how much you want to go into the reasoning, but how do you approach that with the team when when sort of it's clear you've <clears> decided <throat> to move on from a player, you know, sort of being honest with them that, you know, obviously that wasn't the compensation anyone would have expected, but it was it was sort of a decision made by the team. Yeah. To well, um, I don't know what you mean by that's not the compensation anybody expected because – Look, if you look at uh, look at the history of trades and guys in the last year of their contract and things like that, you know, I, I probably would differ with sure. with you in that regard. But um, look, things just come up. You know, you get calls and somebody pitches something and you start thinking about it and you talk it over amongst your staff and you say, "Does this make sense for us?" And and, and this one did. And uh, and CJ is a really good player, good guy, uh, good. He was a good teammate. Um, there's really nothing against him. Sure. Last offseason, when we talked to you about the cap, you kind of <clears throat> painted a, a picture that made it seem like you wouldn't necessarily be extremely active, and you guys still signed a bunch of players, improved at some spots probably even. How do you guys kind of view your cap situation moving forward from this year, and, and do you still kind of feel like there's still going to be a little bit of a, of a resetting of sorts uh, when the opportunity Yeah, set? look, it's, it's going to be tough, and, and, um, and last year was tough as well. Uh, I think if, if you really look at the signings, it was more about, well, we lost – somebody at, at a mm-hmm. pretty significant number and we replaced them with someone at a, a different number, a lower number. Um, and so it, it, there's going to be some of that. There's always some of that. But, yeah, it's going to be tough. And until we know exactly what the cap's going to be, I'll, I won't really know how tough it's, it, it, it will be for us. But, listen, we've kicked this can down the road um, for a lot of years, you know, where we had that window of opportunity with Drew. And, and uh, I still think we have a good team. Um, so we like to keep that extended, and yet, you know, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to, um, we got to work cut out for us. Would you guys prefer to not, maybe have to do as much manipulating with that, and kind of have it be a little bit more uh, easier to manage? Um, it's a good question. I think I, I <laughs> it's stressful, you know, when you mm-hmm. get to the end of the season, and then you start thinking about the following season. And, you know, you've got to get to a certain number. I think what's really made it stressful for us is really just the COVID years and the reduction in the growth of the cap. That, that has been really tough. That's, that's what made it stressful for us. And, look, it's stressful for a lot of other teams as well. Um, 
No, because listen, we're we're in this position because we've had a good roster and a good team, and we've had players that we wanted to keep, and and felt like every year we've had a shot to, um, you know, win a championship, and and um, I'd rather that than have a bunch of cap room and a terrible team. Which which part of it's stressful? Because you guys make it seem like mm -hmm. so easy and so easy to manage. Is is it just knowing that you have these numbers later on that you're gonna have to deal with? Um, well, you always have to pay the bill, right? Mm -hmm. um, no matter what you're doing, uh, credit card or whatever you want to call it, you have, ultimately you have to pay the bill. So, yeah, that's that's stressful. And you know, when 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 you don't have resources, there's opportunities that you don't you don't have, right? Because of that. So, um, that's part of what makes it stressful. Um, but it. It doesn't appear stressful. That's why I like to be behind the scenes, right? <laughs> <laughs> and not in front of the camera. Well, I, along those lines, so we like to ask some of these insightful, more fun questions. And yeah. Mine is since you've been working with with Kai. Yeah. What What is the craziest wrinkle that you guys came up with? Oh that, gosh. That, that you were <laughs> the, the most. Wait, what? Explain this to me. <laughs> um. Boy, I, I'd have to give that some thought. Uh, yeah. You know, when this all started, you know, all this stuff started way back in 1993, I think it was, when we first had the cap. And I think the first year that we had, you know, a, uh, a hard cap might have been when I was in Seattle. We drafted Rick Meyer and um, uh, New England drafted Drew Bledsoe. And so there was going to be this free agency four years out. So, man, what you're thinking about is, gosh darn it, four years from now, some team that has a ton of cap room is going to be able to offer a contract that you can't match. So how can we come up with these tools to give us the best chance to re-sign these guys that were the first and second pick of the draft? And so that's when you start. I think that's when the very first thoughts came into play with teams about, hey, how can we structure these deals so that um, you know we can we can keep our players. Um, that, but look, every team comes up with these things, yeah. and it seems like there's a new wrinkle about every other year. You, you uh, guys seem I think to find the Kai, most. Of I think well, I think Kai knows most of them because yeah. you know that's part of his experience at the league office. He got to see a lot of different things, and he's a super sharp guy, and and we're lucky to have him. Um, all right, another one. Uh, I won't let you. Don't have to say who was the most impulsive person in the draft room. We kind of have our. <laughs> but give me your favorite. Wait a minute. Talk someone off the ledge while the draft is going on. Story that, that you can uh, that you can recall, or or you know just the best debate that came down to the wire. You know, listen. The honest truth is, we've said this before: is all the debates are done before the draft day. They're really not. They really don't happen during the draft. Um, I, I think, look, the, the, the one, in, I don't know that it was impulsive, but we were trying to make a trade with Kansas City um, some years back to take a corner, and God, we were back and forth and back and forth, and it was yes, and then it was no, and then it was yes, and then they wanted one more thing, and it was like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> and then, so we stayed right where we were, and they actually ended up taking the player that we were going to target. So, um that happens sometimes, and, and um, look, we ended up getting a player we really liked, so it was um, it worked out for the best. I think I think oftentimes I say this. Oftentimes, the best deals are the ones you end up not doing. Yeah, uh, that happens more often than than not. Yeah, is that something that does kind of come up a, a lot where you look back and think, man, like we dodged a bullet here? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, um, yeah, absolutely. It, that happens a lot. Um, and I, I don't want to say yeah, yeah, specific yeah. examples because then the names um, get out there and that can become a little embarrassing. But yeah, there's that. I, again, I would say there are more deals that we didn't do that thank goodness we didn't than there are deals that we did that, man, really glad we did. And I think we've done some really good deals, some things that worked out really well for us. Um, you, know, you guys always kid me about us trading up and trading up and. <laughs> Yeah, I just believe that, that um, A, we've had a good track record in the draft, and I think a good part of that is we're finding guys that we want and that we like, 
and we make a deal to go get them. And, and I think that's, uh, for us, that's the right, that's the right thing to do. And, and, you know, including this year when we made a number of moves to go get uh, Chris Olave and Trevor uh, Penning. Um, and look, you know, who knows where, you know, our picks in the future end up with those teams, but, but I like so far. And we have a long way to go, but I like so far that we, we made that move and we were aggressive in that, in that well, regard. I think actually that, that was part of the question that Nick asked earlier is, I know you don't think too far ahead, but when you made that trade, obviously, to, yeah. to give up a 2023 first-round pick, yeah. I mean, was that feeling comfortable that you will be able to address the quarterback position without having to draft one in 2023 early, I guess? Well, um, I'm, I'm still of the mindset we're not going to have to address exactly. the quarterback uh, um, position because, uh, you know, like the guys we've got. So um, I think you have to be, you know, convicted uh, in whatever you're doing. And and um, so we had a conviction that that was the right thing for us to do, and we'll see if it turns out that way. And uh, you guys probably catch more slack than anybody outside your building about how you manage the cap. But it seems like over the last few years, some of the stuff – you guys have done have sort of started to become staples of how other teams manage. Do you see like some of your influence on the league just as far as cap management? Well, I, look, I don't know that. I don't know that. That's giving us probably more credit than is due. All right. Um, but I do think look, teams recognize man, these windows of opportunity can be short, um, and so all you're trying to do is stretch that out for as long as you can. We've seen that with Tampa in the last few years. You know, they've, they've, uh, hey, we're going to stretch this out. Uh, we've got a chance to win Super Bowls um, with the quarterback, and, and we've got a good roster, and so we're going to stretch this out as long as we can, and, and you know, we'll, we'll pay the cost down the road. That's, we're going to borrow from the future to, for right now. I think that's a, that's a good strategy. Um, look, I think in a lot of ways that's what the Rams have done. Now, they've used more. Um, not more, but they've used a lot of draft capital to do that, and they've used uh, um, as well as salary cap. And and look, there's a successful team, reigning Super Bowl champions. And you know, if, when you do that, it justifies you know pretty much every move you make. And and they're doing a great job with that. So, um, I think that look, guys, just see that that's the right um, that's the right way to to, to go about. If you want to, ma- you got to maximize the team you have. Um, when the opportunity exists. Did, did the success of your 2017 draft class in some ways change your long-term plan? I mean, did you eventually yeah. think you would catch up and then you're like, we can't we can't stop because we've yeah. got another nucleus? Well, certainly you don't expect, you know, that many guys yeah. to have that kind of impact so quickly. And, you know, that was, we're coming off those three, seven and nine seasons and kind of feeling like, hey, we got to rebuild the roster a little bit here, take a step back. Um, but at the same time, we still have Drew, and, and so our offense is, even through all those years, is really good. Um, so we were kind of in that hybrid, <laughs> uh, kind of in between, really. And then, man, when, when that class uh, um, all starts contributing, and now you have this core, we're right back in that mode um, with Drew as a quarterback, and hey, we've got to maximize this window. And what are some of the things like if you ever were to say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna rebuild? Like, would it really just have to bottom out, and would it be painfully obvious that like now's the time, or, or is that something you try to get ahead of a little bit? Um, it's a good question. I I really I really don't believe in in you know I don't want to call it tanking. That's not the right word. I don't really believe in tearing everything down. I think you owe it to your players and your coaches to do everything you can to win as many games as you can. Um, but look, you can, you can, and you can rebuild and you can retool um, without having to do that. I, I, I just feel, I think if you, you do a really good job in the draft and you're selective in how you uh, approach free agency, um, that you can improve your team um, and be competitive um, while rebuilding your nucleus. I think that's possible. It's more difficult. It's difficult. Um, and sometimes you don't, you know, you've... You've set these expectations when you do it that way that you maybe you don't meet, but that's you know that's the nature of the business. I, look, I think I just think we owe it to you know everyone in the organization and our fans to do everything we can to win every single game, um, regardless of the circumstances. And last one I got, we got the media wrapping up here. Yeah. When you open up the, the daily clips or the press conference and, and you read the transcript, or 
do you breathe a little a little lighter not worrying about sean giving away who you guys are going to target or anything like that (laughs) (laughs) no listen sean you you guys underestimate uh, him i think you know sean never said anything without a purpose all right Um, he's 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 pretty dang smart and and uh he, you know, when he says things, it's always with a purpose. And I, look, I miss him um, more than you, more than you guys know. He's a uh, look. I I miss even the arguments that we would have occasionally. You know, the uh, we had a few knockdown dragouts, and they're exhausting. And yet, I kind of miss those too sometimes. <laughs> you know, because it, look, it, it challenges you. Um, you know, it challenges you to make sure and rethink your position, and and make sure that you're convicted and. And make sure that you're 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 uh, checking your ego at the door and re- remaining passionate about what we do. And um, one thing he had an abundance of is passion about about um, football, about the organization, and about winning. And and uh, those are all good things. Well, I was going to say, Da had his most embarrassing story. He said when he walked up the stairwell, he walked into Ryan Nielsen's office thinking he was going to his office. He had to pretend like he was there for another reason. Have you had any of those moments yet? <laughs> no. Listen, I think I think Da is doing a fantastic job, and and um, really excited and glad we got we have him. Um, um, yeah, that uh, not really because look, we, you know, Da himself said it. He, he had a 12-year interview here, so we we uh, pretty comfortable with DA, and um, I'm excited about what the future holds for him here. Hey, appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I thought one of the most interesting things that he talked about in here were some of the decisions that they made to go after players, and then the players never arrived. And that's something that we talk about a lot. I I don't want to really like get into naming names because I don't want to like put thoughts in people's heads. But there there are a we few. Know, we know a, fa- a couple famous ones. Well, I mean. Uh, even before you came here, one of the all-timers in 2009, they really wanted cornerback Ron Bartell. They offered him a lot of money, and he picked, I think, the Rams over the Saints. And uh, they went hard after him, like, in the first day of free agency. And then, like, a week later, they settled for Jabari Greer, who was, like, one of the key players on that team, one of the best free agent signings in Saints history. And then we obviously remember the uh, 2017 draft where everything they did was right, except for they had Reuben Foster on the phone, and the 49ers took him, and they settled for Ryan Ram check that's an all-timer <laughs> a, cu- a couple other ones that i think that, that they avoided i think not getting malcolm butler ended up being a really good thing for the team and then you know they were forced to make some other decisions and, and ended up with a much better secondary i always wonder how that would have affected things ruben foster was the one that i was going to say too like that was a major bullet dodge it's just kind of funny uh because they're always in the mix for guys and there's a lot of people you can look back over the years and you're just like man imagine if they would have got him like that would have not been a good move so they um they're aggressive, and sometimes their aggressiveness being put at a halt, I think, is, is the best thing that uh, ever happens uh, for them. Is there anything else you said that, that was kind of eye-opening to you? Well, you know, we thought we would get him to talk about, you know, how innovative the things they were doing with the salary cap. I thought it was very humble, um, where he was like, oh, no, everybody has those tricks. It's not just us. And you're like, you know, have you seen other teams copy? Oh, we can't take credit for that. He can. He's being humble. Um, but one thing that I, I thought he did uh, it was interesting to me, that he thinks the Saints are a little bit of a blueprint for other teams, is how many other teams he sees that are going for it if it's their window to win now. Obviously, the people who disagree with the way the Saints manage the cap have always been like, like, you need to be steady. You want to try to be a playoff team every year forever. You know, the Green Bay Packers model, like never overextend yourself. And the Saints have obviously always believed, we have Drew Brees. We have one of the 10 best quarterbacks in NFL history. Um, we're going to try to win while we have them. And then they have the 2017 draft class, and they still see an opportunity to win because they have so much talent. And they're going to try to maximize that. We'll worry about the salary cap when we don't have that, but when we do, and he mentioned the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Los Angeles Rams, as other teams who are following that win at all costs right now model because let's not waste this opportunity we have. And and he said it. He thinks teams are copying their philosophy a little bit in that. And, and I agree with you. Like, like the Saints were kind of getting uh, beat up, you oh, know, yeah. like, oh, these, no you know, these up. foolish Saints, you know, what are they doing? Uh, and they're proud of that, and they stand by it. And and the fact that it worked for Tampa Bay and Los Angeles when they won Super Bowls, that doesn't help the Saints that much. Um, but at least it proves that that philosophy is right. And those people got celebrated for it. <laughs> yeah, and going back to kind of one of the earlier points I was making before we played the, the interview, 
Part of that is due to them being confident in who they are, not having to worry about an owner reading something and saying, hey, what's going on? What are you doing with my money? This is crazy. Everybody, all these media people say you're stupid. Are you doing things the right way? They have complete trust in what they do, and that's allowed them to operate kind of against the fray a little bit and then build a model that has been influential, that other teams have followed. Oh, wait, this works for them. Yeah. Maybe they aren't as stupid as you know this cap guru says they are. So that's been a huge thing for them. And speaking of uh, things Mickey said, he also mentioned – they never believe in really bottoming out totally. They're always going to try to stay competitive. Yeah. One of the factors in that has been uh, rebuilding a little bit this offseason, that wide receiver depth. They brought in Jarvis Landry. They got Chris Olave, which kind of makes the absence of Mike Thomas this week maybe not feel like the death blow it would have felt like in 2019, say, when they really uh, didn't have... In 2021, it was yeah. a death blow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah excellent point. So, so taking him out of there this week, I don't... It, it hurts, but I don't necessarily know that it would make me change a win prediction to a loss. I kind of feel like Jarvis is going to play a little bit better. Olave has been excellent, seventh in the league in receiving yards. Last year's number one receiver, Marquez Calloway, had an incredible catch last week. He can contribute more. Traquan Smith's going to play. He kind of came back and played really well in that first game. I think his fit with Jameis is probably better than with anybody else, just how much they've played together. But are you... Are you sweating that one too much, or, or do you feel like they can they can kind of get through it with what they have? Of course I'm sweating it. It's Michael Thomas. I mean, sure. he's he's one of the best players in the NFL, and he's going to be missed. But you're right. The receiver depth is good. And here's what we need this game to be. I'm a little hesitant because Alvin Kamara is still on the injury report. is questionable. He was limited in practice all week. I think he's going to play. And last week, he played a good bit even though you could tell they wanted to limit his snaps because Mark Ingram and Tony Jones Jr. both worked their way into the mix or Dwayne Washington um, but with uh, it's it's time for like a Camara game um, and I think an Andy Dalton offense you know lends itself to that because I think he'll be a little better at throwing the ball to, to Camara a little more naturally I think they'll lean on the run game more and that's what they'd love to do they don't want this to have to be about the passing game and the receivers they want to control the line of scrimmage they want to control the time of time of possession they want to put long extended drives together and if Alvin Kamara can be back to being special he's the answer to that question you know he makes up for for you know what whatever they're missing with Jameis Winston and Michael Thomas not being on the field yeah, look, it's kind of funny because if you're one of these quarterbacks on the Saints, you look at their situation, they don't have the first round pick next year, they don't have a ton of money, they have a really good roster everywhere else. If you're a quarterback who's on the fringe of being a starter, there's opportunity here <laughs> and to seize that all you need to do is get the ball to Alvin. All you need to do is get the ball to Mike four yards away. All you need to do is get the ball to Jarvis over the middle on a seven-yard crossing if route. If everybody creeps down and doesn't like watching that dink and dunk offense, then go ahead and hit him with Chris Olave. <laughs> right. And if you just do this and you don't turn the ball over and you're efficient and you allow this defense to win games, you're not just the starter this year. You're the starter next year and maybe the year after that because they aren't going to have this like great opportunity to replace you. Maybe Sean Payton goes somewhere and they get a first round pick and that changes. But I think this is a team that's kind of looking in that second tier quarterback market and saying, all right, can we win this way? Can we build this incredible offense, put all these first round picks on the offensive line? That hasn't quite worked out as hope, but that's the theory. And you can see the theory on defense as well. So you bring in these other guys. OK, we aren't going to have the opportunity to get Aaron Rodgers, maybe. So this is how we got to win. And Andy Dalton could could really seize that job doing that. I think that's all they want to see. I think the idea with Jameis was stay out of trouble and then hit these deep shots to kind of open things up. You kind of reverse it a little bit with, with Dalton. But whoever operates that better and cuts down on that turnover risk, I think really has a shot to be the quarterback, maybe not just this year, but going to camp next year or at least into the offseason with the idea, okay, he's a starter if something weird doesn't happen in the draft or a good quarterback doesn't hit the market and say, hey, I want to play for the Saints, which – also could happen. Like if it's, gonna a, it's gonna be a deep market next year. If they say six rookie quarterbacks are gonna be drafted in the first round, there's gonna be a lot of Jameis Winston, Andy Dalton, Teddy Bridgewater types times, you know, the six guys that are gonna be out of jobs next year when their teams draft first round picks. Yeah, like if Rogers were to become available, he might look at a roster like this and say, Hey, I wanna go there and then we see how that kind of works out. That's a pie in the sky theory though. So it'll it's gonna be interesting. Um defensively Things could be a little bit tougher. I don't think, you know, P.J. Williams probably starting at safety again, I think is going to be the play. I 
strongly believe that Marshawn Lattimore will shadow Justin Jefferson. That would probably put Roby in the slot. I think Adebo is going to be on the outside. Um, how do you feel, feel about that matchup now after going through the week? Love that matchup. Uh, I think we mentioned it earlier this week, but that's the biggest reason for optimism against this team. That's the Vikings' biggest threat, and you have one of the best threat erasers in the league in Marshawn Lattimore. I can't wait to watch that. Um, we, we're going to be so hyper-focused on the offense, but you know, like when the Vikings have the ball, I want to watch Lattimore on Jefferson as much as possible, and so far he's been bringing that, uh, as we mentioned, just did it. Uh, the, the, all the DBs did so well against DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson last week, and now I think you'll get more of Paulson Adebo than you did last week. So that's a big advantage, but then you lose some of that secondary advantage with Marcus May out of the lineup. But, um, you know, we've stopped talking completely this week about one of the hottest topics last week, which was the Saints pass rush, because as we said and as the Saints said, those were, that was game plans why they weren't being real aggressive against Atlanta and Tampa Bay. They got to Baker midfield. They only sacked him three times, but they affected him, you know, a dozen times it felt like. So we're less worried about that. But again, they're going to have to get to Kirk Cousins as well in this game because everything we're talking about, everything you were just talking about, about how this team is built for the defense to win their games and the offense just has to be pretty good. Well, the defense has to be special. The offense only has to be pretty good. The defense has to be special. Yeah. Last week sitting here, the last time we we were doing our podcast, I, I, I didn't feel great about their odds for some reason. I just kind of had a, a feeling things weren't going to go well. I kind of feel I kind of feel like they're going to turn around this week. It feels like they bottomed out against a really bad team. That was one of the worst losses, honestly, I feel like since I've been covering this team. Uh, the Miami game was really bad last year, but this was a team that was presumably good, losing to a team – that's presumably really bad. And I think that team knows they're a bad team. Like they're supposed to be that bad. Saints looked horrible uh, last week. I think that bottoming out though, and then coming here, being in a little bit of a football retreat, I think everybody kind of feels the urgency a little bit. I think they're going to bounce back. I think they actually win this game. And this might be the dumbest thing I've ever said because the backup quarterback's playing, the starter's out, Mike Thomas is out, the starting safety, the very first player they signed in free agency is hurt. But I think they're going to figure it out this week. Yeah, and, and look, you know, I'll predict that they're not going to miss both of their field goal attempts and they're not going to be uh, fumbling kickoff returns. And, and, like, I mean, last week was so ugly that some of that stuff has to turn around. Um, but this London thing, you know, obviously I wrote about it at, at length this week and, and, you know, about how the Saints just believe in their track record and everything they say makes so much sense. Come here Monday. Get acclimated. Spend the week bonding together. It's worked for them time and time again. It works until it doesn't. It doesn't guarantee a win. But, I, I mean, everybody puts, like, Vegas gives you, like, a three-point home spread for being the home team. Coming here Monday versus coming here Friday should affect the point spread by a couple of points. I mean, that may, should make the – it doesn't mean the Saints are going to win, but it should make them the favorites. It really should. Yeah. And also, if you're going to change your starter doing it during a football retreat week, is probably uh, a pretty good circumstance because everybody's locked in. They're getting used to them. They're spending more time together than they normally would. Um, so we'll see what happens this weekend. We'll have all your coverage from Tottenham Stadium. Keep it locked to New Orleans Top Football. Put your hands in the air, cause it's on right now. Yeah, we back up in this thing, and we coming for the crown. They trippin' Kev on the mic. It's about to go down. We in the dome right now, we in the zone right now. Put your hands in the air, cause it's on right now. Yeah, we back up in this thing, and we coming for the crown. They trippin' Kev on the mic. It's about to go down. As you can tell, last year it was an off year. But we reloaded, and now it is our boss year. A Debo back there, and yeah, we got the badger. Don't forget my shun and don't forget the pass rush.